Ready, set, go. All right, you're good. Hi, everyone. I'm Mary Ellen with Headwaters Science Institute, and we're back streaming live on this big day of giving. Thanks for joining us. If you're just tuning in with us, Big Day of Giving is a 24-hour online fundraiser for nonprofits. So we're glad you tuned in. What it means for our students is that they we can give out more scholarships for our programs and we can continue doing our free science online lessons. So thanks for joining us and we are going to jump into our Thursday Science Challenge with Headwater Science Institute. All of our activities are designed to give students hands-on, real-world opportunities to study science. So today, we're going to look at insects. Uh, we want you to investigate the biodiversity and the abundance of insects in your yard. Despite their small size, insects are the most interesting and adaptive creatures on our planet. They have some fascinating survival strategies and most importantly, they are decomposers and pollinators. So that's gonna give us a hint of where we can find them. So your challenge is to see how many different species you can find in your yard. There's a few tools we can use. Uh, simple tools will be a jar and some tweezers. If you happen to have the insect sweep net that we made last week, this will be really helpful and a journal that you can write down your observations. And if you have an insect identifying book, that's very helpful. If you don't have one of these, you can do what Andy showed us this morning, is you can take a picture on your phone and you can use the photo to identify the bugs on your in your internet. So let's go for a walk and see what we can find, where we can find insects. So up here in Tahoe, one of the first things that's blooming right now is the manzanita. So let's go over there. And because insects are pollinators, we're going to look at the new flowers that are coming out. The manzanita flower is a beautiful pink-shaped cone flower that has a small opening at the end that is perfect for a pollinating insect to fly right up to and, and get its sweetness. And I'm looking in this bush, and I don't know if you can see it, there are a whole bunch of flying insects hovering. And a lot of them are little flies, but right in the back I'm seeing one of the California honeybee bumblebees that's getting a lot of nectar in there right now. Um, that, these might be challenging to get with tweezers, but if you have your sweep net, you can survey the top of this bush. So another thing that insects like are cool, kind of moist places. And over here, there, okay. <laughs> over here, there's a log, hopefully you can see me, that I'm gonna look, I'm gonna, actually I found this cool guy under here a few minutes ago, so I'm gonna put him back. But something like this is a perfect place to look for insects. And I found, I'm not seeing, oh, there's another one. What I found under here was this cool black beetle. Oh, stunned. But I don't know if you, yeah, good. I can't, I, I don't know if you can see him, but I'm gonna look him up in my book because he's a really cool specimen. Remember, insects have six legs. That guy has six legs. If he had eight legs, he'd be a spider. So another cool dark place that an insect might like is, here's a dead log over here. And if we roll it, nothing here, but if it's dead, oh, you can peel up the bark. And if you look under here, I can't see any insects, but I can definitely see evidence of insects. And there's a lot of wood-eating critters that have gotten into here. So this might be another clue that I could come back later and see if I can find what it is that's eating that wood. 
Another cool dark place are rocks. They're the really good place to find an insect. Here's one I can roll over. Oh, and I see some tiny little ants and they're crawling all over here. So I think that there's an ant home underneath here. I don't think you can see them on the rock, but they're crawling all over in the dirt. So what I could do or what should do is get my nature journal out and start recording how many I've seen and what they are and make some uh, notations of their color and how many legs they have. Or you can whip out your phone and take a picture. Another cool place to find insects is on trees, live trees. And what you're going to look for are little tiny holes that are bored into the tree. This is a big hole. That's probably a woodpecker. But these little tiny holes can be an indicator of a bark beetle. Up here in Tahoe, we have a bark beetle that's getting pretty prevalent. And it bores into the bark. And it gets underneath the bark where the tree is transporting uh, water and nutrients. And then it takes advantage of all that stuff that the tree is bringing up. Um, if you live in a coastal area, it, you could find similar stuff on oaks or on poplars. So this is a really good indicator that there are some kind of insect around. Um, I did go hunting out into the outer forest. And what I found, I'll put it on this net right here, is a gall. And a gall is a super cool thing to look for. And I'll show you right here. Something you might have seen a lot is this willow gall right here. It's, it's a really green leaf and then you see red dots underneath it. And that is an insect laying eggs on the plant and it's stimulating the plant to form a covering around it. And then as the egg turns into a larva, it eats the plant, the the leaf surface and feeds itself and then eventually grows into an insect and if you're lucky and you find these and you put them in a jar you can time it right so that you can watch them as they emerge so this is a really cool way to look at insects and find out what's going on in your yard so now that i've shown you where you might find some insects Go out into your yard and see what you can find and take some pictures and you can share it on our website and on this video comment and then we can share that to other people. Um, we, if anybody would like to donate, feel free to take a moment now if you like what you see because we're going to put up a few pictures of some local students that we did a program with and after we show you a couple pictures. We'll be right back and we'll be talking with their sixth grade science teacher, Julia Anderson from North Tahoe School and she's going to share with us some of the stuff that they did. Yeah, there's a picture. <gasps> that went fast. I was like five minutes. Oh my god. So this is a picture of the North Tahoe Middle School students during their research presentations. In just a moment, you're actually going to have Julia Anderson and Marianne are going to come in and uh, they're going to ask some questions about what their project was like. This group studied many cool things, such as the bark beetles that Marianne just shared with us and all sorts of other things about the trees around their area. Here's another couple photos. On the left, you see some research students 
with the uh, with the sugar pine, the tree that they were studying. Um, this group, um, the sugar pine is a really neat tree because it's the tallest species of pine tree and it has really big pine cones. You can see some of these pine cones on the ground in here. Um, another cool thing that this group did was if you see the gentleman on the right here, he uh, um, was using these quadrats that um, the, uh, um, to survey for insect holes in there. And so it's a really neat part about this program. Um, and then the last thing is, now's a great chance if you haven't donated yet today, you can do so at the bigdayofgiving.org slash headwaters. Um, and in just a moment here, I'm going to open things up. We've got Mary Ellen and Julia Anderson, the science teacher from the North Tahoe Middle School. We're going to talk a little bit about their program. I want to read a few uh, thank you notes. Uh, oh, we'll do it at the end. How's it going? How are you surviving this uh, crazy times in teaching? Good. Yeah, it's definitely tough, especially with science, when you want kids to be outside doing hands-on activities and yeah. they're stuck inside. But yeah. Um, we're surviving. Good. I just realized it was just about this time last year that we did this project with your students, um, different times, but can you tell us a little bit about what they were studying and what they did? Yeah, um, most of the kids, well, they were looking at the sugar pine trees and trying to figure out the health of the sugar pine trees. And so um, a lot of them had questions about how the soil affected the trees or how the number of bark beetles that they could measure affected the growth of the trees. Um, what were the different types of trees around the sugar pines and if there were even sugar pines in our, um, in the ecosystem behind our school to kind of measure forest health. Yeah. And how did they collect that data? Um, so they were using different tools that you guys provided, um, like the quadrant where they could count a certain number of bugs in the quadrant and then compare that to um, like the height of the tree they were trying to measure using some um, Pythagorean theorem math. And then um, they used a soil core to look at soil color and pH and moisture and whatnot. They counted the number of trees around and they used tree guides, um, keys to identify the different trees in the area. So they were really learning a lot about what is in their backyard. Um, yeah, and then tape measures to measure things, so. And they get, do they do the presentation then? Do they share it with the class? Yeah, afterwards they all created a PowerPoint presentation using Google Slides with their group members. So most of them were in groups of three or four students and they all worked together to um, present their findings in a kind of a lab, science lab format with their materials and methods and some graphs and conclusions that they could draw from their results. So, um, yeah, it was great to see a lot of them concluded that they needed more data because they didn't take enough trials and needed to, it was inconclusive data if they didn't uh, see any trends because they didn't collect enough data. But um, yeah, just seeing them go through that whole process and learning how to do science and really um, ask valid research questions and learn how to appropriately test those questions and collect data was really, really powerful for seventh grade students. I know, I remember a couple of them realizing that they didn't have that much data and how important that was. So it was, mm -hmm. it was a good learning lesson just for that. Yes. Do you that have was, any uh -huh. highlights of any kids that you remember? 
Um, yeah, I had one student who is very disengaged in school. He doesn't like to do anything. He hates writing stuff down and um, he's usually too cool for school. And he started off too cool for school when we went outside to collect data. But then we separated him from his friend, who was also pretty negative about the project. And once his friend was gone, he actually started to do stuff. And it was really cool to see him like actually smiling and helping measuring the tree distances and really just saw him come alive in a science scientific way he was like oh cool we can uh we taught him about how you can um smell the trees to try to find out what type of tree it is and he was just like whoa that's really cool they do smell different and like seeing him smelling trees and <laughs> measuring actually using a measuring tape um, when in class he barely picks up his pencil. So yeah. that was one of my favorite things to see. You know, that that strikes me as well because I've seen that with kids I know working in the program and it's always kind of a, a surprise. One of the, I, I, I remember your kids really well. They're super enthusiastic and uh, <laughs> it was fun to see them going running outside. But um, the one takeaway I got from your group was you know, we went out into the backyard at North Tahoe School and it to the to most people, it just looks like one big pine forest. And they were trying to figure out what was going on with the sugar pine versus the other pines. And so they had to go through this process of keying it out and identifying the trees. And all of a sudden they were realizing, oh, this isn't just one big green blob. There are different species and different things that are going on in the ecosystem. And it was kind of a neat a uh, way to see them open their eyes to, uh, you know, seeing more of what they've already seen. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. Definitely. Well, thanks for joining us and uh, sharing what went on with your class. They're a super yeah. fun group. And um, we are going to, thanks for tuning in everybody for seeing what our programs are like. Uh, we're going to take another short break. So if you feel like pushing that donate button. This is a good time to do it. And when we come back, Spencer is going to be talking with a couple of our teachers, some real dynamic teachers from Sacramento that did a program with us. And I think you'll enjoy what they have to say. Oh, before we do that, <laughs> um, uh, we're going to thank a few of our donors. Hold on. If I can get there. Here we go. Thank you for being patient. Amy Rogers from Sacramento, thank you very much for your contribution. Nancy Fiddler, much gratitude from you to you for, from Crowley Lake. Lori Sindel Sauro from Fair Oaks, thank you very much. And Katrin Larson, yay, from Washington. Uh, we love you. And our t-shirt winner is Marianne Cullen from Menlo Park. We'll be getting a hold of you. So thank you, everybody that's donating. We are very grateful for your support. And here comes Benson. Perfect. Well, thanks, Marianne. It was great to see your science lesson. Um, and talk with Julia Anderson. I was sad that I was teaching with a different set of students and didn't get to join Julia during her science program, but it was neat to hear about what went on between you and her there. And so that was great. Awesome. And I do have a great update to share with everyone. To date, um, today, Headwaters has already raised $7,621 so far today, um, and the day is still going. The really important thing is today we have a match for donations. So every time you donate, the donation that you get will be doubled up to $10,000. And so that's a really cool thing we have going on just for today. Um, and so... If you donate $25, that is $50 for science education, um, which is pretty, pretty special. Yay. I know, it's great. And then in just a few moments coming up next, I'm going to interview uh, two teachers 
Lori Sindelwaro and Chris Chu, who both taught with us during science programs this past fall and winter. And so we'll ask them a few questions in a little bit. But before we let Mary Ellen go, I just wanted to ask her kind of, um, why did she, what do you get excited about teaching science with Headwaters? What makes you want to come out and, and do the science teaching that you do? Well, I've spent some time in the classroom for many years. And um, I think what I keep remembering is our very first test program we did locally. Uh, we were trying out our methods on a local class and I had already worked with this class. So I kind of knew the personalities and um, I had a, a pre judgment of how the program was going to go. And I was, to be honest, a little worried and, oh, this isn't going to fly and they're just going to check out and not be interested. And once we got the kids outside, it was phenomenal because kids I'd seen uh, like Julia was saying, in the classroom were unengaged, not interested, bored, all that stuff. All of a sudden, these, these two kids just started asking questions and looking around and um, they just light lit up. And that was an aha moment for me that, oh, you can change things very subtly and have a big impact. So um, I've gotten continual experiences of that with all of our other programs since then that um, it's just really cool to see kids get psyched about the outdoors and what's going on in our world. Yeah, that's that's some of my favorite um, parts of the teaching that we get to do and teaching with you, Mary Ellen, um, seeing kids who might be hesitant or don't think that science is for them, um, finding a topic that they can get excited about and seeing where that excitement takes them um, is, is really special. And we get to hear from a lot of teachers like yourself and Julia who said, um, you know, this kid wasn't super engaged before then, but this really worked for them um, is, is pretty special. Yeah. Um, Good Mary, time. Mary Ellen, do you have a favorite type of plant or organism or flower or insect that you like to share with teachers, with, uh, with students when you're teaching? What's kind of your go-to thing if you're trying to share some great experiences with, with students? Uh, well, my favorite flower is hard to find. So if I find it and I'm with kids, I kind of go ecstatic. Uh, it's the shooting star, mm -hmm. but it is an early bloomer and it's usually in a wet environment. Um, so that one doesn't happen a whole lot. But uh, whenever we see mushrooms, that's really unusual. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, anytime we can find something that isn't happening all the time, I get pretty excited and try to share it with everybody. Ah, oh, perfect. That's great. Um, and so I think we've got uh, Chris and Lori ready for us to join um, and for their interview. So we'll say goodbye to Mary Ellen here and we'll say hello to. Um, Lori Sindelwaro and Chris Chu. Um, these are both two awesome science teachers that we get to work with okay. in the Sacramento region. How are you both doing today? We are doing good. Yeah, that's perfect. Well, you know, I, I know you had a, a day of teaching already today, um, and we appreciate you taking the time to, to do this. Um, and our goal here is that a lot of people watching at home maybe haven't seen what a science program is like. And we're hoping to ask you as some teachers who've seen some of our science programs to tell people a little bit like um, about what it, what it was. And so for this first question is um, kind of what types of research questions or research project, projects did your students do? Um, we'll start with you, Lori, and you can just tell us a little bit about the type of research projects that your kids did and then we'll go to Chris. So the types of research projects that our kids did um, were anything to do with soil analysis to looking at vegetation and plants. Um, some of them did stuff on insect populations and communities within different areas, like within the streams, within the fields, within the forest, um, other ones did um, some moisture content 
uh, soil effectiveness for growth and diversity of plants. Some did um, some chemical water analysis to see how that affected macro invertebrates in the water. Um, some counted, did uh, grid quadrants sampling on where certain species grew in different areas and whether there was more growth near a creek or further away from a creek. Those were some examples of some well, of the things they did. That's a huge diversity of different projects. Um, Chris, I know you've had some winter programs and some spring yeah. programs. What are some of the your favorite projects that you've seen your students do? Uh, so mm -hmm. I work with high school chemistry students and a couple of biology students as well. Um, and the ones that stand out to me are in the winter. Uh, I mm -hmm. guess the last few years we've been going in the snow. And so some of their experiments include uh, how do different altitudes affect the purity of the snow? So mm -hmm. turbidity or uh, what's in the snow at different altitudes. And so that's an adventure. We have to hike up to the top of a mountain and collect okay. samples there. Um, is the snow colder on the surface compared to underground? And so that's where kids like dug six feet down, 10 feet down, just to get measurements and see uh, the temperature difference. And then another one, this one was kind of fun. Uh, the kids didn't want to go outside too much. So they stayed indoors and they wanted to see how fires affected the water's cleanliness. Uh, so that was, I think, the year when there's a lot of California fires. And so they're just interested in seeing how fires um, get into our water systems. And so they stayed inside and burned things. <laughs> yeah, um, that's awesome. And so one of the neat things is that, you know, if they there's a topic that they're really interested in, they can kind of pursue it. And so the, the next question that I, um, I'm going to ask you to is, Kind of what does it look like a little bit during the time when they're doing their projects not necessarily in kind of the measurements that students are doing but in terms of the the student experience of collecting data and you observing that um, what is it like for a student to go out and collect data outside um, and we'll start with you laurie again here um, i think it's probably more exciting than doing like a fixed lab in a classroom um, just because they are engaged in learning about the data they're collecting for their particular research. Um, kids will be running up to their little identification insect books mm -hmm. and trying to figure out what it is and flipping through those. Um, I saw a lot of excitement out there just because they're down on their hands and knees and taking nets and looking in creeks. Um, I think that's just the excitement of watching them want to learn. Mm -hmm. Well, in the that's, field. That's great. And Chris, what about you? I know it sometimes looks a little bit diff a little bit different when we're in the winter and there's snow around, but what's it like for a student to collect data during one of your programs? Uh, I just think it's an adventure. Uh, they're going out and hiking and exploring different places and collecting data. Uh, one year, I think they made their own tool, like kind of like a fishing rod to collect water samples from way far away. Um, it's a really neat experience. Cool. Um, that's awesome. Um, yeah, kind of a lot of ingenuity in there. Um, and so the, the next thing that um, I want to kind of ask you is because myself as a teacher, I only get to see the students during the three to five days of the science program. But you know your students from before and during and after the program to kind of see where they're coming from, what they're experiencing, and where they're going to. So kind of in your experience as a teacher, what are kind of some of the, the takeaways that stick with students from these programs? Um, and we can do the same thing and start with Laurie and then go to Chris here. I think this definitely develops critical thinking skills. Um, they go from starting with a very broad idea and narrowing that down and then they actually have to go out in the field and collect it. And sometimes things don't work and they have to figure out something else to do to collect it. Um, and then in the end, when they they analyze their results, and they're different than what they thought. It brings up more wandering questions. So they have more questions and they they want to continue investigating because it's exciting what they learn. They're actually more excited when they're wrong than they would have alternative questions that they want to find out. Well, I think it's going to do this if I test it this way. So um, I think the critical thinking out of all of this, besides the experience of just being outdoors in a place that they've never been before is probably the most exciting. 
Perfect. And what about you, Chris? Uh, science is a process. It, it can be messy, uh, like Lori mentioned. Um, kids come up with their own questions and they start researching and deciding how they're going to gather data. And sometimes that doesn't always work. Um, but that's part of the fun of it. Uh, when I see them at the end of the day, uh, they're tired, but they're not tired because it was a long lesson or it's boring. Uh, they're tired because they were working really hard. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, well, that's that's great. Um, that's that's pretty pretty awesome to hear. And so, um, the last closing question that I have for you two um, is if there is. Uh, a moment in any one of these programs where you saw a student, um, whether it was scientific or just someone having a great time, but kind of what do you what do you take away when you think of a Headwaters program or um, something popped into mind of what's a, a highlight from one of you um, about your time with us? Um, how about Lori? We'll start there. Um, I would start with every time because I've worked with hot Headwaters at another school. So I've probably been on three trips with them. Mm -hmm. um, when I take away from this, we made eye movies and I can watch those over and over again, just seeing the kids excitement on what they're learning. Even if it was the playtime where they're exploring nature or actually doing the, the researching, um, the kids enjoyed being out there. And if kids are enjoying what they're doing, then they're engaged and learning. And that's really all we want as a teacher. Perfect, thank you. And how about you, Chris? Uh, I came up with a small list. So they get exposed to some high level statistics, like stuff that I think I saw in college. <laughs> um, they have some experience with what uh, field work looks like uh, instead of just being in a science lab all the time. Uh, they get to see what real science is about, uh, real life science. Um, and like Lori mentioned, it's a lot of fun. Uh, for some of my students, it's their first time actually seeing snow. And so that's that's a big deal. Um, not all the kids have opportunities like this. Um, cool, well, that's great. And um, thank you both for tuning in today to tell us a little bit more what it's like to be um, an educator in one of these programs. Um, and we appreciate both of you and uh, can't wait to, to work with you again um, whether it's this coming fall or next spring. Um, and uh, yeah, you're both great teachers we love working with. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, bye. Perfect, and then up next we have joining us um, Headwaters board member, Erica Seifert. She's been here since the very beginning of Headwaters. Erica works for the NEA, the National Educators Association, and has been super helpful for us and myself in understanding where teachers are coming from and how we can design programs to um, best uh, meet their needs. Hi, Erica. How's it going today? Hi, Spencer. It's so good to see you. Perfect. Thanks. Um, and so uh, I, uh, I just wanted to... Um, talk a little bit about the interviews that we just saw with Lori and Chris. I know you get to talk with teachers all the time. And so you were able to watch a little bit of that from the backstage. And do you have any thoughts on, on what we've gone over here? Yeah, it was great to watch your interview with, with Lori and Chris and see how um, passionate they are about uh, science education. Um, one thing I know from working with educators all over the country is that they care so much about their students and they want to um, get the best education for them. And Headwaters really helps teachers to, to provide that. I thought that um, Chris said something interesting. He was talking about, you know, the opportunities that his students have to work on high level statistics, do field work. And he said real science. And it occurs to me that this is something that most students don't get access to until they're in college or grad school. And students in your programs are getting access to um, exciting science challenges and science research uh, at a much, much younger age. And so that is that's really exciting for them. Perfect. Well, that's very well spoken. Um, and then one special thing that we want to do right now is we actually um, have some donors we'd like to recognize. If I look at our current total, Headwaters is up to having raised $7,704 for science education today, which is awesome. Um, and Erica is going to join me 
in thanking some of these awesome donors who've donated so far today. And so Eric, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, yeah, thank you to Jeff Yi in Sacramento, to Andrew Jeske in Citrus Heights, and thank you Pia Black in Sacramento. You are helping teachers like Lori and Chris, and you're helping um, their students uh, through your generous support. And as many of you um, know, uh, donations today are being matched by a generous contributor. So um, all of those donations are, are doubled because we, we have a, a donor match. Is that right, Spencer? Absolutely. So we are matching up to $10,000 today. So if you donate $50, that's $100 for science education, which is a great opportunity. It's today only um, to really make a difference for students like Lori um, or students that Lori and Chris work with um, and many others. So if you haven't um, donated yet, we still have, what is it? 2000 and change left in our match. So you can click Absolutely. the big day of giving link in the description of um, this video. And please, please do that because your dollars are going, um, are going for double right now. Perfect, exactly. And so um, coming up next later today at 4.30, we have a really special happy hour. We have a great concert from some awesome Tahoe area musicians, the Dead Winter Carpenters as well as a special couple rounds of trivia with Headwaters board member Craig Rowe and some awesome cocktail recipes um, for those of you who want to celebrate with us on this awesome day at home. So we're going to sign off for now, and we'll see you back here at 4.30. Thank you, Erica, and thank you everyone so far who's donated and made this a really special day.